All right, good. Twelve. Despite the three ums, I'll give you twelve. Uh, what was this? Uh, fifth period? We in? Okay. Anyone else need to go? I did not wish. I did not wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary, nor did I wish to. No. Wish. It kind of like started. Yeah, yes. Uh, let's go with Ashton and then you, you, we'll give you another shot. Ashton. Very nice. Six. All right, Ian. Oh, that'll do it. I went to the woods because I wish to live deliberately, despite only the essential fact that I feel like not one of those had to teach. I did not wish to live. I did not wish to practice. I did not wish to live what was not life, living is so dear, nor practice resignation. Um, I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life and to live sturdily and as far in life as to put out all that was not life. All right, three. Why don't you come and see me? I'll work on that. All right, very nice. Um, very much. Hold on a second, Aaron. How, are you sure you didn't go? Yeah. Positive? Yeah, yeah. I got it. I mean, I can get there. All right. Get there, so. Let's see. Oh, can I go? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to find only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. And not when I came to die, I discovered I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. To live so sturdily and spartan like I could put throughout all that was not life. To cut a broad swath and stage close. To drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest point. And if it proved to be mean, then to, then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it. Or if it were sublime, to know it by experience. And be able to give pure account of it in my next excursion. Okay, good. Ten. And Aiden, uh, save the best for last, Aiden. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to find only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what I had to teach, and not when I came to die discover I had not life. I did not wish to live what was not life, living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation, unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and spartan like as to put to right all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and stage close, to drive life into a corner, and if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it, and publish its meanness to the world, and if it 
it worth the wait to get a full experience of it? And be able. And be able to shiver, shiver through a tenth of it in my next explosion. All right, good. Nine. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, the next, I, I won't assign it today, but the next speech uh, we're going to do is one from Ahab, and it's, it's easily the best speech that you'll ever memorize. It's, it's awesome. It's very good. Ah, uh, so last night's reading. It was pretty short, yes? Did it seem uh, consequential in any way? Ah, ho, oh, hey, whoa. Can everyone get their books out, get their notebooks out? Can you say that again? So I think it went to more of Herman Melville speaking rather than just my own. Wow, that's, that's pretty good, right? Did everyone pick that up, that um, we get the voice of someone other than Ishmael, right? We get Melville speaking. Yeah, where, where, where did we see this? Um, we see this when he's... Uh, In um, The Advocate? Yeah. At the end of the advocate? Yeah, when he's yeah. Asking, oh, yeah, when he's asking, when he's answering all the questions about like whaling and whether it's not like respectable. Or whaling, like, not respectable? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, so what does he say? Read the, read, the, read the section where we get his voice. I mean, really, um, I mean, that last paragraph is the biggest. Yeah, 99. On page 99. And as for me, if by any possibility, there be any as yet undiscovered prime thing in me, if I shall ever deserve any real uh, repute in that small but high hushed world, which I might not be unreasonably ambitious of, if hereafter I shall do anything that, upon the whole, a man might rather have done than to have left undone, if at my death my executor will more properly make my creditors find any precious MMS in my desk, then here I prospectively ascribe all the honor and glory to whaling, for a whale ship was my Yale College in my heart. Okay, good, right? So um, did everyone else pick that out when you were reading? Did you say, like, there's a change here? These chapters seem different than the chapters we've had, right? So I want you to m mark this down, right? So far, just about all the chapters have, have done what? Told a, told a story, right? It's just been straight narrative for the most part. Uh, philosophical at times, maybe, in the first chapter, but mainly just plot narrative. Okay, So when this book was published in 1851, a lot of critics uh, panned it. They said, this is a terrible book. This is bedlam literature, they called it. They said it's crazy. And one of their um, complaints was that it didn't have the regular form of a novel. Right? It had these weird chapters that just kind of go off on their own, um, you know, just they're, they're not narrative at all. Right? So we're going to see a lot of different kinds of chapters. Okay? What would you call this one? What is this chapter really? First off, what's the title of it? Yeah. The Advocate. Now, did anyone give any thought to what that means? What is an advocate? Dara? Okay, yeah, absolutely, right? Someone who supports a cause. Is it a legal term? Anyone know it as a legal term? Like what's an advocate in a court? Yeah, it's a lawyer, right? So here's, we're going to see more of these chapters. Here's a funny little chapter. It's as if Ishmael is arguing something in court. Okay? Um, so it's more of an essay, right? Okay? Um, but note, as an essay, he does the same kind of Ishmael things that Ishmael always does, which is what? When he has something to describe or something to explain, how does he do it? Yeah, Carly. Okay, yeah, what kind? Give me some examples that he uses. He says that whales are like so noble and all that. Like he compares the whale, like there's a constellation called the whale. Uh huh. There's a. Uh, Cetus. Like, mm -hmm. And then uh, he, in some Roman, ancient Roman uh, processions, they would use whale bones. Then for coronations, uh huh. Whale oil. As, I mean, that's, that's all I can come up Okay, with. that's good, right? There's like three distinct images there, right? Think of it. Um, there's a constellation named after the whale. Is, I mean, is there a constellation named after you? No. No, okay. Maybe someday, if you're great, right? Uh, Roman emperors, when they 
came into the, to Rome in triumph, there would be whale bones waiting for them, right? As if like, here's your trophy. Kings are coronated with oil, sperm oil, okay? So are salads, by the way, oil. He, of course, Ishmael has to make his jokes, right? Okay, yeah. He also relates the blood in Wales to like Scribbles and Floating Men and American History Done Me from Penny and Ishmael. Well, not the blood in Wales, but the blood in whalers, right? So he claims that Benjamin Franklin's step ancestors have been whale, the Folger family. Uh, are there a lot of Folgers on Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket? Not in Martha's Vineyard. Not in Mar but in Nantucket. Are there? There's a couple. There's a couple he knows, right? You should all go, <gasps> <gasps> right? So yeah, they're on Nantucket. There's still the Folger family, and they're related to the Franklins. Is that an American royalty? Yeah, so noble blood, very good. As a little aside here, in your own essays, how often do you do that? How often do you find some image that is unique and clear and fresh? I just read all of your essays, all but yours, um, and yours, CJ. And uh, you don't do that, right? You never do, you just tell us, well, but this is what I did. You never come up with that startling image, okay? That's what would elevate things, okay? Ishmael gives you a million examples, okay? Alyssa, were you gonna say something? Yeah, so you already said it. Oh, I'm sorry. The oil okay, yeah, to anoint kings, good. All right, um, but we'll come back to that. So that was chapter, what number was that? 24. 24, so 23, we gotta, we gotta do some 23. 23 is very short, how long is it? Six inches. Six inches, right? Oh, what's it called? The Lee Shore, yeah. Okay, now, um, I think because I don't think any, none of you are really sailors, right? Any sailors? Okay, do, did you, do you know what a Lee Shore is or did you pick up what a Lee Shore is from this six inch chapter? Anyone know what that means? This is, a, this is actually a technical thing, right? Note, some of his chapters are technical chapters about sailing or whaling or other technical thing. So this is kind of a technical chapter, but we'll see it's also a, he tells us about a Lee Shore, but he also uses it to, he's talking about Bulkington, but it's, it's very philosophical, isn't it? Well, we kind of get a hint that Bulkington, like the Pequod itself, bad things are going to happen. Carly, what were you going to say? Um, when you were asking about the Lee Shore. The Lee Shore, yeah. Maybe just maybe like protected from the wind. Yes. So like leeward versus windward. Yes, but, yeah, keep going. So the Lee Shore would be like the side that's not on the wind? Mm, actually, no. This is a confusing thing, right? So let me, let me school you up on a little bit of uh, nautical terminology. What Carly said is absolutely correct. If I am a ship, if I have a ship here, um, here's my ship. You know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point it the other way. Don't laugh. It was that. That's <laughs> self-evident, isn't it? This is an island, okay. okay? Here's my ship. By the way, only uh, vessels that have three masts are called ships. All others are boats, uh, in the age of sail anyway. So if I have my ship here and the wind's coming this way, okay? As Carly said, this is the windward side of the ship. This is the leeward side of the ship. You with me? Did you, are you diagramming this? Are you writing this down in your journals? Okay, windward, leeward, right? As you know, uh, we've talked about uh, the Bernoulli effect earlier this year, right? So this picture, not very good, because you can't sail directly into the wind, right? You have to sail at an angle to the wind, correct? Okay, so windward, leeward. However, this would be the lee shore. Okay, now, he, what does he say about the Lee Shore? Do sailors like the Lee Shore in a gale? A gale is when the wind's blowing lightly, light breeze. No, what? A gale is heavy, right? Close to hurricane force, right? So how do captains and seamen, how do they feel about the Lee Shore in a gale? What's that? You avoid it because, let me, I'm going to have to draw another, Another diagram here. Let's, let's look at it from, uh, from the sky. All right, this will be better. Okay, so here's an island. 
Here's, here's an island. Here's a ship. Yes, and we have our sails like this. The wind's blowing that way, so the sails are like that. Okay. Now, you know that the Bernoulli effect would create lift and pull the ship that way, yes? But what else is happening? If the wind's blowing this way on the ship, what else is the ship going to be doing? Yeah, it's going to be moving this way. This is called Lee Way. Okay, not like um, our friend, the junior Lee Way. I, I'm so sad she's not in this class. I, I would have been delighted to use her name like this. Um, so the ship has leeway, right? So even though the ship's going that way, it's getting pushed that way. If you do sail, you know that a, a sailboat has a what on the bottom? A keel, which helps counteract that force, right? But it can't completely counteract that force. So here's the deal. If there's a really, really strong wind, the last place you want to be is on a lee shore because your ship could get pushed onto that lee shore. And what will happen to it? It'll founder. It'll, it'll more than run aground if it's a gale. It'll be destroyed. Okay. Does everyone understand that? The lee shore. Okay. So you want to get a lot of leeway if a storm is coming on. You want to be well out to sea so that you don't have to worry about your ship getting tossed up on the rocks. You with me? Okay. Now, um, Balkington. This is uh, an important chapter. This is an important theme, actually. So, um, what do we, what is he, why does he entitle this chapter the Lee Shore when we're not on a Lee Shore? It's about Bulkington, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe since like the wind is seen as like restless and like that can be kind of like restless sailor. So I don't know. Maybe it's like okay. seen as the same thing. Okay, so on the surface, that makes some sense, but if you really look into the metaphor of the Lee Shore, it goes a little bit deeper than that. Okay, why is Ishmael so, he says he holds him in, um, what kind of awe does he say? Sympathetic awe when he sees, what does he notice when, he, when the Pequod sets sail? This is on Christmas morning, or Christmas evening actually, and he looks and he sees... Bulkington there with the whalebone in his, in his hand, right? The whalebone tiller. And why is this so shocking and surprising? It is really cold. That's true. It's December 25th. But, yeah. Yeah, remember when we were in the Spouter Inn, those uh, lively sailors who came in, and there was one guy who stood apart? He was part of the Grampus, very good. And they had just gotten back from a four years voyage, whaling in the middle of winter. Remember the crewmates were all drinking up a storm, getting the full Cape Horn measure. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, but what was Bulkington doing? Sitting there and eventually he left the wall. Okay, was he uh, enjoying the conv convivial atmosphere? No. no, he wasn't. He wasn't really enjoying himself at all. When he left, did people chase after him? Yes. Bulkington, where's Bulkington, right? Okay, and Ishmael like notes it. It's like, ah, Bulkington. So here he is again. Okay, now what's so awe inspiring about Bulkington at this moment? Yeah. Well, isn't he getting ready to go on another voyage? Yeah, we, we're, we're afloat, right? He's going out for another three years. How long was he on shore? A couple days. He says, the land was what to his feet? Scorching to his feet. Okay, was it really? No, okay, of course not. I don't think so. Right? So, um, so Bulkington's going out again, right? which is pretty crazy. Um, and he says, let me only say that it fared with him as with the storm-tossed ship that miserably drives along the leeward land. Now, you understand that now, right? right? If you're a captain of a ship in a storm and you're driving along the leeward coast, are you miserable? Because you think you're going to? You're going to, yeah, you're going to um, run aground and be destroyed. The port, now underline, mark this, mark this. This is really important. This is on 94, about uh, 15 lines down. <clears throat> the port would fain give succor. What is succor? Succor? Hello? What is it? It's like comfort, okay? It would like nurse you. The port would fain nurse you, okay? The port is pitiful. Now, you'll, this is not Mr. T talking, right? Yes? I pity the fool. You know, you know Mr. T? No, you're not Mr. T? Coach T. No, not Coach T. Who's Coach T? 
Okay, yeah, from the 18th. Okay, pitiful here means it gives pity. I pity the fool who doesn't know what sucker or pitiful means, right? Um, <laughs> in the port, I'm kind of a ham. You know, it's just me. In the port is safe. All right, underline. In the port is safety, comfort, hearthstone. What's a hearthstone? In front of the fireplace. Remember old, uh, uh, never mind, just the hearthstones, the fireplace. Supper, warm blankets, friends, all that's kind to our mortalities. Okay, so in a storm, do you want all those things? Do you want all those nice things? Yeah, yeah you do. They're comfort, right? Um, but in that gale, the port, the land, is that ship's direst jeopardy. She must fly all hospitality. One touch of land, though it but graze the keel, would make her shudder through and through. Fights against the very winds that fain would blow her homeward. Seeks all the lash, seized landlessness again for refuge sake. Forlornly rushing into peril, her only friend, her bitterest foe. Know ye now, Balkington? Right? So look. In the storm, what does the ship, what must the ship do? Can it go to port? No. What happens if it goes to port? It's destroyed. So in the gale, it must seek out the open seas. Okay? Avoiding what? Comfort, land, safety, succor. Right? You understand this? Okay. So Bulkington is like the ship that must go out to sea again. It has to avoid all that's comfortable to our immortalities. Okay? How many of you are like that? How many of you, like, must seek out the danger. How many of you had st struggled giving up your little devices over that week? Okay, so what is the ocean according to Melville here? A remedy. Remedy from what? Like from uh, the land, like a secure. It's not secure though, oh, I, like, it's yeah. dangerous. Cure. Okay. All right. So let's let's go on a little bit further here. Um, okay. I'm going to keep reading. Glimpses do you seem to see that mortally intolerable truth? Oh, I'm sorry. Glimpses do you seem to see of that mortally intolerable truth that all deep earnest thinking is but the intrepid effort of the soul to keep the open independence of her sea. Right? What is deep, intrepid thinking? What, what do we mean by this? Deep, intrepid thinking. Yeah. Yes, it does. But what, yeah, what's deep, intrepid thinking? Hardcore thinking? But what is that? Philosophy, philosophy right? Look, philosophy is hard because you have to uncover hard truths about the meaning of the universe, right? Now, is Bulkington a philosopher? Is that what's being said here? Um, Bulkington's just a sailor. And what's, uh, what's Ishmael saying about him? He's a represents. He represents the philosopher who's not content to do what? Like accept comforts of life and accept the... Yeah, or like accept um, living through life without knowing the what? or the harsh truths of the universe, right? Right, remember, Thoreau, he wants to know whether it be mean or not, right? <coughs> yes, and if, he, if it be mean, then what will he do? Publish the meanness to the world, right? Is Thoreau going out to sea as well? Well, not really, but he's like living in a log cabin. Okay, yeah, his sea is, let's just say, not sea, but wilderness, right? Yeah. Okay, is the ocean a wilderness? Right? Does it, does it, um, is it the opposite of port? Absolutely, right? Um, okay, so look. Uh, While the wildest winds of heaven and earth conspire to cast her on the treacherous, slavish shore. How many of you felt a little slavish during our little essay experiment of giving up uh, some luxury? Did you feel like a slave to that luxury? To your Netflix and your video games and your, your iPhones? What do you mean? Like, that it controlled you, you don't control it. You, my friend, who I see chimping all the time, looking down like this in class sometimes, perhaps, perchance, right? Do you feel slavish to those things? I mean, 
Did you have a strong compulsion to go and use those things when you knew you shouldn't? Yeah. Yeah. Dost you? I dost, you should say, right? Um, yeah, so look, here is Ishmael going off on like, going out to sea is like being a philosopher, okay? Um, but as in the landless alone resides the highest truth, shoreless, indefinite as God, so better is it to perish in that howling infinite than be ingloriously dashed upon the lee, even if that were safety. All right, um, so basically he's saying like, look, this is what a true philosopher does. He goes out into the dangerous, stormy sea of deep thought. Do you understand? Okay. So the Lee Shore, this is going to be a major theme here, right? Like, why is Ishmael going to sea? He's going to find some truths about things. Uh, so far, do you think this is going to be like a, a happy truth? Is it going to be sublime or mean? Probably a little bit of both. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, so that's the Lee Shore, only six inches, but we spent a lot of time on it. Um, we talked about the advocate already, right? Uh, I, think, I think we kind of covered that, right? It's, it's an argument. What are well men according to the advocate? They're noble, right? Um, so let's be real, realistic here. There are, I mean, there aren't many whale men left in the world today. There are some people who stu, still whale. We kind of look down upon them, right? Whaling we see as a, kind of a horrible, like, bad thing for the environment, right? Whales have almost been made extinct, okay? But what would be a uh, analogous profession today that you would kind of say, like, oh, whale men were probably like this? Would you say kings and nobles, or would you say something less? You yeah, like what? Yeah. yeah. I kind of compare it to like the how hunting of elephants for their ivory tusks. Okay, but that's not like a profet like this whaling is like it's a legal. major profession in the world. Like it's a major industry. Yeah. So give me like a major industry that we take for granted. Uh, we don't really think about the people who produce the thing that's being produced, but it's probably not like an exalted job. It's not probably not the job your parents envision you uh, landing after your prestigious education. Yeah. Uh, garbage workers? Okay, not a very prestigious job. Uh, yeah, okay. I'd go with that. Like, no one here is like, uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm going to get my garbage. Uh, I'm going to be a garbage man. I kind of, actually, that's not true. I've always wanted to be a garbage man. <laughs> get up early, get some exercise in, a lot of lifting, a lot of running, get to ride on the back of a truck. Uh, especially in the winter when the smell's not too bad. Doesn't seem so bad to me, right? Beats doing this. No, uh, kidding. Um, uh, how about I, I, have, I have another? Caitlin, you had one. Do you, I, uh, it's kind of like the whole like, like the, the elephant thing. The elephant thing. How about this? Yeah. Well, I was going to say people that work in the meat packing industry. Okay, yeah. They're butchers. Yeah, because people, I was just saying in the example that said some people look down on it yeah. and think it's bad. Yeah. But like everyone, well, not everyone, but most people eat meat in the same way that almost everyone uses whale oil. Okay, yeah. Now, do you think you could make that same argument that the butcher is noble? Could you say, like, oh, the butcher is, is as great as a soldier, right? The way he says it. Or could you say um, the butcher is like a king? Or the butcher, the butcher discovered Australia, freed South America from the Spaniards' rule. Doesn't he say all these things? Okay. Now, you could if you really tried, right? Are these arguments he's making really that truthful no. they're kind of well, how would you i mean they're, they're they are truthful in that whalemen were sometimes the first people to find pacific islands and things like that and they did bring trade and missionaries and things but um are they how would you characterize them yeah exaggerated. they're totally exaggerated right again that's ishmael he's always kind of joking around a little bit okay um i was thinking like roughnecks on an oil rig you know what a roughneck is? That's what you call a guy who works on an oil rig, right? Kind of cool name. Um, and, you know, oil, you know, obviously petroleum is used for what whale oil was used for back then. Okay. All right, so that's the advocate. Now, then we get this little postscript, right? What is, what is a postscript? It's like a PS, like, oh, I forgot. Okay, um, we're going to skip by that. What's the next chapter? Knights and squires. Interesting. Does he talk about knights and squires? 
I mean, has he ever? Yeah. 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 Probably. I mean, I can't imagine that there's not a reason. Maybe it's so important that he needed two chapters. Because it is knights and squires, and we only... Who did we talk about in this chapter? Starbuck. Starbuck. Did we talk about any knights? No. Does he use... Um, does he use is this a motif, though? Knights, nobles, kings? Is this something that we see a lot of? We got the salad dressing uh, analogy in the postscript chapter, right? So... Perhaps Starbuck is the knight, okay? Um, he didn't actually really tell you Starbuck's function yet. Do we know what Starbuck is, who Starbuck is? First He's the first mate, who's basically second in command on a ship, okay? He's also going to be um, in charge of a whaling boat. So here's what happens. The whaling ship carries whaling boats, and when they see a whale, they lower the whaling boats, and the mates, the first, second, and third mates, uh, are basically the helmsmen of the whale boat, and their um, harpooner is the second most important person in that boat. So knights are the f mates, okay? Um, so we got knights and squires. In, in uh, the feudal world, what's a squire to a knight? Yeah, he's like his almost apprentice and helper. So the knights are... Uh, the mates, right? And we found out the first mate is Starbuck. Did we find out who the second mate is? A guy by the name of Stubb. Did we get the third? Not yet. And then who do you think the squires would be? They're the harpooners. Do we know any harpooners? Yeah, so Starbuck's harpooner is going to be Queequeg, right? And what is, um, what is Ishmael calling these guys? What are they? What is the first mate? He is a, he is a knight. And what is the harpooner? He is a square. Now, what did the advocate just finish doing for us? What was it arguing? How awesome the noble whaling is. Yeah, no, whaling is a noble, a noble pursuit. So if it's noble, who partakes in that pursuit? Knights and squires, right? Okay, all right, and we get a lot about Starbuck, and, and we need to like start uncovering who the. Have you ever heard that name before? Does that name ring a bell? Starbuck. Yeah. Oh, you know Mr. Matson's parrot, Starbuck. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One morning I was trying to was going to pick Mr. Matson up to drive to school, and he called me, and he's like, ah, hey, uh, Kev, that's my name, um, uh, uh, hey, um, I'm up in a tree right now, I'm trying to get Starbuck, um, and I'm like, what? He's like, and I drove by, and he's like 60, literally, literally, 60 feet in a tree in his suit, and there's like a bird, like, on a perch out there, and he's like, come here, come here, he's like, got a little cracker in his mouth, he's like, mm, Starbuck, strange man, strange man, um, all right, but let's look at this chapter, shall we? Before, I, f I fear we're going to run out of time. So I want, to, um, I want to actually skip talking about Starbuck directly and go towards the last part of this chapter, which is very, very interesting. Okay. So <clears throat> go to page 102. Um, and one or two, he, starts, he says something like, um, men may seem detestable as joint stock companies and nations, knaves, fools, and murderers there may be. I mean, let's think about history class. Have we studied joint stock companies? Yes. Were they filled with knaves, fools, and murderers? I mean, didn't one joint stock company start the, the Seven Years War? A world war? For what? For the Ohio, for a profit, right? So... Here's a little history lesson, right? Ishmael says, like, yeah, joint stock. If you look at a joint stock company, you're looking at knaves, fools, and murderers. Okay, look at look at the corp. You know, look at corporations today. Do they do wicked things in the name of profit? They do. Okay, um, but the man, he says, is like a kind of ideal. Okay, um, 
he says, um, I'm just going to skip down a little bit more. So basically, this is going to be a, a, a story about like men and like their ideal qualities. But this august dignity I treat of is not the dignity of kings in robes. What does that mean, the dignity of robes? Is he talking about like your smelly uh, terry cloth bathrobe that's hanging on the back of the bathroom door? Like a king wears robes, right? Okay. But that abounding dignity which has no robed investiture, thou shalt see it shining in the arm that wields a pick or drives a spike. That democratic dignity which on all hands radiates without end from God himself, the great God absolute, the center and circumference of all democracy, his omnipresence, our divine equality. Let's label this here. Let's call this, um, this is like a democratic ah, aesthetic. Right? That is, where does he see greatness and glory? Not in kings and robes, but in what? Hard yeah, hardworking people. Shining in the arm, right? That wields a pick. Who wields a pick? Gold miners. Gold miners. Uh, okay. Who else? Think about the 1850s. What's being built in America? Railroads, right? It's, you know, like uh, John Henry, right? Steel driving man. He wields a pick. So, what is he saying? What, what is Ishmael saying? He's going to do what to the common whaler? He's going to do what? Yes, romanticize it. Elevate him to a what? What kind of place? Noble, right? Um, shining in the arm. Do you guys, you guys all remember the Iliad, do you not? Uh, there's one character who every time we see him, there's a light shining on him. Who is it? Hector, Hector right? Ah. Okay, well, we got to pick it up there. We'll pick it up with Starbucks. For homework tonight, um, it's, on, it's on Whipple Hill, but uh, College Prep is going to read 27, 28, 31, and 35. Honors will add 29 and 30 to that. Okay?